Hi, my name is Paul Morans. This part two on the oral history of the Synodon is the eight years later from part one, so you can see the physical changes in me. A lot of that is a result from chemotherapy and illnesses that actually stem back to the rattlesnake attack on me. I apologize that I must uh, be a little bit more difficult uh, speaking than I was in part one. The other thing is even if you've watched part one before, we found that several tapes were missing. And uh, we have since reloaded them, so part one now is a more complete history. One tape was missing, so what I'm going to do here is talk about that time period. But before I do that, I also want to say that there is some urgency that AA Minority Report, you could Google that, AA Minority Report 2017 or Synodon, published 120 some odd pages, uh, study of the effects of Synodon on AA and the TC movement, and that there, just as this world is becoming more uh, tyrannical, globalized, greed, rule, greed rules, comma. There has been changes in the Betty Ford Foundation uh, and the TC world where it's exploited for money and the younger people without such wealth who really need a residential helpful facility have much fewer choices because people are choosing to make it for the rich who basically if they really understood it and they weren't so megalomaniac that they want to be so uh, peppered uh, that uh, they could probably resolve their issues on their own with a good therapist. The other element is, is that at the same time that AA has, uh, in UK, tried to raise this warning flag, a dissertation got published by Columbia Press, a dissertation at the University of Kentucky by Claire Clark, who decided not to tell the factual story of Synanon and to lie by omission and to cite people for the opposite of what they said and to conceal from the public the true story of Synanon. And what stands as a danger that it might be believed and that a rehab should not follow these mistakes that I have led. You know, with that, I want to again say before I start that most of the people that came to Synanon were good people wanting help or to give help or wanting utopia. The story of Synanon is that its system that it used was powerful enough to keep people from using drugs while they were in Synanon, not necessarily when they left. But it was also powerful enough to force people to have bisectomies, give up their children to strangers, to take strangers in replace of their spouses, and then to commit violence. 87 separate attacks are indicated in Synanon records where they bragged of knocking out teeth and getting the enemy. They attempted three murders, one of which was me. Now that stuff is told in uh, uh, 
my book, From Miracle to Madness, and my other book, uh, Escape, My Lifelong Work, work Against Galton. My website are basically just research center on it's all over the internet. But apparently Claire Clark, the dissertation writer at uh, University of Kentucky, couldn't find it. And the UK uh, AA used the same expression as I did in describing her work, which is called The Recovery Revolution. I sort of hate to give it any publicity, but it basically lies by omission and it lies by its quotations. We're going to discuss the period that's not in uh, part two, which is, uh, begins with sort of the time of Synanon II, um, which is 1968, but we'll start a little bit, going back a little bit, is that uh, very early in Synanon's history, uh, and I've seen tape recordings of the games, uh, the message was communicated that you can never leave Synanon, that anybody who uh, leaves Synanon is going to go back to drugs. And finally, uh, in 1967, an article appears in a magazine by a writer who says that uh, he actually had to slug his supervisor to get out of Synanon and that if he could communicate one message to Diedrich, it would be, you're more successful than you think, so let our people go. And, but Sinanon by then had shut the doors. The message was given that if you go back out on the street, you will die. You must never leave Sinanon. Now, the, he would post on the board, and, notifications of everybody who left, who od I'm not so sure it was really known at that time, but it is known now that the most dangerous time for an addict is when he leaves any rehab, because unless he's educated to the fact that because he has taken time off, he no longer has the tolerance he had before. So he's in very much danger if he uses the same level of OD. Yeah. An example of recently history is Philip Seymour Hoffman, you know, who uh, fixed up after many years of abstinence and died. Um, so people were afraid to leave Synanon. The other thing that is very important about Sinanon is that the early people who came and was declared the miracle on the beach, they were 35 years and older. And basically is known today that most people 35 years and older can mature away from drugs without any form of intervention. Those with very strong psychological needs would probably need to see a therapist. And the youth still remains the problem. So, Synanon was verse 13, or over 35, and very dedicated. When the miracle on the beach was declared, uh, and the courts began to send young people, it was unsuccessful. Now, did this cause Diedrich to close graduation? It may have. But it's also true that as early as 1964, Diedrich was buying property in Marin County and had plans to build a Synanon city. And what he needed to do that was a labor force. And so he needed to keep everyone. He needed to keep everyone to work without charge so that Synanon would grow wealthy. His only cost was the expense of feeding them and packs of cigarettes. So it is likely that that was a significant factor. Diedrich at the same time knew that he needed squares, that um, addicts were four-fingered 
and he needed squares, which were non-addicts, to run his industries and businesses and real estate purchases. So to recruit the squares in the Cernon, he created the Cernon trip where people were invited to spend three nights and two days with little sleep, subject to uh, set up attacks on them on games to break them until they would cry and when they were broken to be told that there was salvation sitting on. And of course they were encouraged to make high donations. Sometimes uh, people threw it all in. So this is the point where Sinanon becomes wealthy. The population is now part addicts and part uh, uh, squares. But they will continue to raise money from the 500 uh, corporations on the grounds that will buy, buy our products and you save a life. By the end of this period, Diedrich will say, I don't want addicts around anymore, just as he didn't want children around anymore. And he will say that um, addicts should be kept down by their airstrip in Visalia and that we bring them here to do the slave work, wash the pans, pots and pans, and if we like them, we'll let them have lunch. So this is the start of it. So it's the building of Sunanon City, the, the closing of the idea that you ever leave, and the idea of containment that you don't contact your family, your friends, and you don't, do not go off the, off the property. If you went off the property for some synonym purpose, such as a sales trip, the, you had to go with a group of synonym people, you had to stay in the same hotel room, and you had to play the synonym game to reinforce synonym to you on a 24-hour basis. At the same time, the addicts who were protesting the arrival of the squares were taken into a stew in Marin County, and it was 72 hours without sleep. Diedrich attacked them for their lack of vision, and then he brought out the flies, which were young kids that he trained to be vicious in their attacks, who would continue the attacks on these people without sleep. Diedrich used to say that if you kept someone up long enough, you could get him to believe anything. Diedrich, at the end of the 72 hours, came in and said, salvation is still at hand, except my vision, and you all will remain saved. By the time of Synodon three, Diedrich was much bolder. He said, in five years, you'll all be gone and the people here won't be anything like you. Now, this is possibly the most horrible part of what he did to people inside Sinanon, is that in convincing them that they had to stay in order to stay alive, the addicts, whenever something was done wrong, he would throw out maybe five or ten people picked at whim just to get across the message, you cannot go against him. You cannot fail in what your assigned task is. Now, for the people that were thrown out, they believed they were being sent to death. And that certainly was the people that were there. This is like North Korea today or some of the other uh, tyrannical groups that have you know, sprung up all over the world, you know, unkilled his uncle and his brother. That's a great message to the people of Korea. You support him, you applaud him, you do not dissent, or you die. Just as in the Philippines now, they kill newsmen, you know. Um, it's, um, This is where it was. Sinanon in his second stage went into a Orwellian world. And the roots of it are in the system of brainwashing. 
that basically brainwashing works and it will allow it to work on anything while you're in the environment. It could make you stay off drugs, it could make you do as Synanon did, have a visectomy, abort your child, give your child to strangers, take a stranger for a spouse and give up your spouse, knock the teeth out of teenagers, and attempt three murders. When Synanon ended, the question was raised by the Attorney General, could all members of Synanon be arrested for supporting a criminal conspiracy under the RICO Act? I responded, yes, because Synanon now had the wire, a closed circuit uh, broadcasting system, and the speakers were in every room, as George Orwell's 1984, that um, that everyone knew about the violence and the attacking of people and everybody who stayed to support it was basically guilty of conspiracy. But I also said that it would be a misuse of resources. I said the one who was responsible was Charles Dieter and that these people once released from his power of control are not going to be a danger to society which I think has uh, been proven. And so the action was not taken. So as Sunanon progresses, he becomes more and more authoritarian. And finally, Sunanon decides to build another city, Visalia in the Badger Mountains. And um, here, Wherever they go and wherever they went, they were out of the zone and had zoning fights. And uh, by this time, the big important thing is the Godfather. That uh, Al Pacino, as Michael tells Diane Keaton, you know, that he's just, you know, it's just business. And, and she, it's like the government, and she says, the government doesn't kill people. And Al Pacino says, now who's naive? It almost sounds like Donald Trump, I know, but um, um, the fact is that the biggest fan of The Godfather was Charles Diedrich, and that he then began in 72 in Marin County to uh, sit out by the pool and have people come to see him and kiss his ring, his hand, and, um, and he would grant them wishes. Diedrich said and taught his supervisors to at least reject every one, either one out of three or one out of five requests just to keep power established. And, um, but uh, Diedrich would proclaim that the, uh, that the uh, horse's head was a stroke of genius. And after that, there is a whole sledge of Sinan documents where Diedrich compares himself to the Mafia and that the Mafia knows that uh, the best way to get respect is to uh, break bones. When he buys Visalia, he says there'll be a seven-headed Hydra monster attacking and controlling the entire community, which it became. Um, 87 instances of violence. In Viasalia, Ron Edson almost had an automobile accident. They came at midnight, held his family at good point, and with the rifles, smashed him on the, uh, on the ground. The only reason they didn't kill him was they realized that inside the house that the, that the police would probably been called and they take off, and he didn't die, but he was hospitalized. Phil Ritter, who complained to the police that uh, about the forced bisectomies, they came and clubbed him over the head, and the only thing that stopped his death was the um, people heard the heard it and saw it and began shouting, and the, and the attackers. Or two members of the Imperial Marines ran away. One of them 
Joe Musico was the same person who tried to murder me. Um, Cinnamon built a sort of resort in Visalia with waterfalls and silk tubs and developed what was called gracious dining. They would eat large meals. And so for the people in Cinnamon, it was, uh, it was like and Dietrich said this himself, intentionally, it was a return to Rome. We were living like the Roman Empire. But the Roman Empire was based on slavery, and so was Senon at this time. Um, I want to know that over the last 40 years, well, Senon ended in 1991, I'm going to tell you how that ended and why. And just and that will be the end of this. Uh, but I have been visited by uh, Cinnamon people and Cinnamon children of Cinnamon people because they realized that in closing Cinnamon down, they got their freedom back and they finally had their lives back. The kids, if Cinnamon had not been closed down, would have never gone to college. Cinnamon ended schooling at the age of 13, and the only programs existed for kids was to teach them how to work for Synanon. So that's one of the reasons why Dietrich uh, insulated the rules against having children. Uh, to have a baby was, quote, crap of football, close quote, and uh, they don't pay off for us because they all want to leave. So we don't even get something in return for the cost of raising them. Now, here's how Sunan ended, and it's also going to lead up to the willful lie that UCLA Special Collections has been doing to the public for, since 1991. Peter Bourne was the first drug czar for the... United States. And uh, it was in the Carter administration, and Carter's sister was into uh, New Age religion and, uh, uh, you know, the occult and the cults. And uh, she invited Warner Hart of Est and Charles Diedrich through Peter Bourne to, to the White House. When Diedrich got that solicitation. He moved into Washington, D.C. and purchased the Boston House apartment building, which was to be the Synanon Embassy to the United States. But in June of 78, with my help, NBC did a segment three, three-part night, uh, about 15 minutes each episode, special on Synanon and the changes and the violence. So because of that, the media in Washington, D.C. camped outside of the Boston House, particularly when some members of the Boston House, including a employee of uh, Ambassador Adlai Stevenson, you know, the one who famously said during the Cuban crisis to the United Nations, to the Russian ambassador in front of the world, after showing them pictures of the Cuban missiles, of the Russian missiles in Cuba, said, explain that, and I'll wait for your answer until hell freezes us over. Well, they took Adlai Stevens' aid and in the elevator threatened him physically. And one Sunan person turned to the other and said, see how quickly they shut up? And uh, so their protest you know, went to the White House and that just brought more media. And so Diedrich and Howard Garfield, his attorney, come out and the press was like the Pazzarotti and uh, Diedrich shoves a photographer. Apparently Garfield somehow participated at least in the police size because arrest warrants were issued for both Garfield and Diedrich. 
rather than appear in court, Diedrich and his entourage fled to Italy. And efforts were met then put to, they wrote a letter to the White House, cc'd it to the Supreme Court and everybody in the world that you're not a fit place for democracy and, uh, and we are leaving Washington, D.C. And, um, and then they sued, sued the owner of the Bossing House saying that, well, he lied about uh, zoning and we won our down payment back. This guy was very courageous. He took on the Synanon uh, legal machine, which had like eight lawyers, none of them which had salaries. And uh, he wrote a cross plane saying, you drove out all my tenants because you fraudulently concealed the fact that you're a terrorist organization. And that set the courtroom scene. Now, Diedrich gets drunk, turns, returns to drinking in July. When news of it reaches Synanon, they begin to have drunken parties all over Synanon. They had gone back. They had totally reverted. It is believed that it is from Italy that Diedrich gave the orders to get Phil Ritter and me. Howard Garfield, for reasons he's never revealed, left Italy and left Synanon. And everyone knows that something was discussed that he wasn't willing to go along with. And um, when I basically deposed Garfield later, it was a person that was hid behind attorney-client privilege, it would not answer a question, and was very, very afraid. Of course, this was after the rattlesnake time. Now, here's what happened, is that now, by 82, the IRS has revoked Synanon's charitable status on the grounds that Diedrich stole the money and that they were a terrorist organization and it's against public policy to not pay taxes and do things that are against public policy. So terrorism is certainly against public policy. And so the IRS filed a lawsuit to tax Synanon retroactively. Before it was hired by the IRS and we were putting on all the Synanon documents attached to a summary judgment motion where it is clear that they are comparing themselves to the Mafia, they're giving orders to, to break people's bones, and that they've done it. People are bragging for attention on how badly they've beaten someone. And J.D. Diedrich, the daughter of Chuck Diedrich and a board man, says we have to prove on these things so we do them better in the future. And so we had all this stuff, and so there wasn't any reason for trial. You know, here's the, here's the proof. And, you know, boom. But before that ever motion is heard, in the Boston Howe case, the defense secretly backed up and helped by the Department of Justice of the United States, puts on an 11-day hearing of ex on people, by the way, who are cited for the pro synonym argument in Claire Clark's book, and they're testifying in this hearing to Synanon destroying evidence. And the court after 11 day hearing makes a finding that after Diedrich's arrest for conspiracy to murder me, there became a conspiracy in Synanon to destroy documents, tapes, and evidence and delete references to them in their computer system involved a large portion of the Synanon population and directed by their legal department. Therefore, since you have destroyed evidence relating to the issue in this case, was Synanon a terrorist organization that they concealed it when they bought it and that they terrorized the tenants, uh, we grant victory to the owner because you destroyed relevant documents. Now, there's another rule that says that once you have a finding against you, in one case it can be used in the other. And I actually told, it was my idea, by the way, to the IRS, 
to amend their summary judgment motion to say that that we only have to prove the same thing that they, in fact, it's proven because all we have to do is show them the legal decision that it would be against public policy to, to be allowed to be uh, free of taxes if you destroyed the evidence relevant to whether or not you were violating public policy. And the Department of Justice agreed with me. They amended their action. They amended their summary judgment motion. The summary judgment motion was heard by the same judge who heard the Watergate tapes. Boy, did he have a deja vu. <laughs> and uh, he ruled that, um, that, uh, that the government wants us to make a finding that there were a terrorist organization and we could do that, but it's not necessary because it's been found that they destroyed evidence relevant to that issue and therefore they lose. The next case was the assessment. And as you read the opinion, it's like the judge is adding up all these things, the value of the lifestylers, the values of this, the value of the free labor, blah, blah, blah. And it's like he calculates it to 55 million in 1984, which will gain 10% interest per year. Sitting on it, his highlight was worth 33 million in about in 77. So basically, uh, sitting on appeals all these verdicts, but they finally, the appellate courts, you know, deny them all. And sitting on Forbes magazine does a big expose on Synanon saying that they've been raising money by lying about the fact that they're in rehab when there hasn't been any rehab in Synanon for, you know, probably, you know, eight years. Eight years. And um, in fact, the FBI was going to file a, a lawsuit against Synanon for making those representations. And, uh, but it was no longer necessary because Synanon wasn't going to be able to pay the, uh, the lien and the doors closed in 1991. However, Synanon still lives. It lives in many of its clones from sea to street. They're all gone the same way. And part of the reason that it still lives and that two books, one by Rod Jensen and the other by Claire Clark, exist is because the Diedrich family set up an archives at UCLA and there at UCLA they have the watered down selected pro synonym writings of the 60s and they don't have all the negative things. They don't have anything about the violence and they don't even have the criticism, they don't have Simon's dissertation and uh, they don't have anything. In 2013, I offered my collection to UCLA, and at first they said accepted it, but now they don't return phone calls. And they are contributing to a conspiracy that I would say uh, to lie by omission that was first set up by the Diedrich family. It's part and parcel to the fact of the, what was found by the courts, a conspiracy that began in 1978 to destroy evidence and to try to keep it and keep knowledge. I actually have waited in thinking that one day, probably when I die, that Sunan would try to somehow push or someone would publish a book like Claire Clark's but it actually happened while I'm still alive. But I've always been aware that there was a danger. Now, two years ago, I posted the True Synodon Archives online, telling the story that I just told you, and putting up the inventory of what I have. So you would just Google Synodon papers or archives, and it says the real one. And, um, and you can see online everything that I have and an explanation of what it, it contains. 
I have every newspaper article I've ever written on Stone. I have every magazine article. Most importantly, is I have much of the documents that Synodon destroyed. It is from those records that I wrote The Miracles of Madness. Um, this is an important story for anyone who's listening because there is a movement within TC to readopt the Synodon system. And it has the people who have exploited it most in the 40 years were just as sociopathic as Charles Dietrich. And in some of these places, if you read from Miracle to Madness, the Legacy, or read it online on paulmorance.com, you will know that the wilderness programs and other programs uh, were like soon on, on steroids and that children died. You know, they died in the snow and cold. They died of lack of water and the heat. They died because someone sat on them. You know, it's um, it's nightmarish. You could also read Mia Solovich's Help at Any Cost. And as I said earlier, um, Clark uh, actually cites Mia Solovich as being in support. Mia Solovich has a book review uh, on this. Uh, I've been contacted by one person who wrote a positive book report and found out about my book report that I wrote up and now realizes they made a terrible mistake and is researching it to straighten it out with his readers. Um, but it's bigger than just a book. It's about the education system and to understand that the idea of a TC that Sinan had was good. Its methods of attack, rewards and punishments, control of your lives was bad. It was brainwashing and brainwashing you can't have it as a cure because you can't have it in anything. Because let's suppose that it, as it is at Sinan its early stage, don't use drugs, don't eat a lot of sugar, you know, exercise, you know, it works, but it also works when you say, give up your child, have a vasectomy, abort your baby, give up your husband, and then finally, you know, kill the enemy. It works. So, who is to say, you know, that the leader has a mental collapse, the leadership changes, but the system is set up to, to what? Put in Helter Skelter? This is like nuclear energy. It is dangerous. We need rehabs and we need TCs. We need to know the distinction of the good parts of Synanon and the parts that need to be kept in a container that says dangerous do not open. And I thank you for your time in listening to this. Um, I think we're talking about politics, the world, the study of Synanon or any uh, basically dangerous cult is sort of a microism of governments and nations. We learned that, um, what to avoid. It's, uh, it's, it's George Orwell's Animal Farm, as well as 1984. Thank you.